Simon Helberg coming off a big Golden Globe weekend. Uh, let's talk about that first. What was the experience like now that you've gone through it? Well, um, it was, I, I sort of felt like I left my body a, a little bit, which is good. I'm not that crazy about my body, so why not take a trip away from it? Um, and uh, yeah, I got to, I, 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 I genuinely had a moment of, of really actually being, you know, you always hear, oh, it's just an honor to be nominated, and you think, oh, they're probably really bummed when they lose or bitter. I, I genuinely almost forgot about the idea of winning or losing until the category came up, which was first, and I started to have major palpitations of just the idea of getting up on that stage. Uh, and then it was done, and everybody goes about their business, uh, you know, as usual, and... Um, but I got to, Jeff Bridges came up and said, like, we're losers, man. Look at us. We're in the loser circle, man. I was like, well, you know, I think I'd almost rather be a loser with Jeff Bridges than, than a winner on my own. Uh, so it was really amazing company. And, and I was sitting, obviously, with, with Meryl and Hugh and Steven and uh, good, good, good view of the stage. Great seats. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a, a spectacular night for me. Yeah, good table. Not a bad, well, I, yeah, I said it, and it kept saying, do you know where you're sitting? Uh, when I was doing the red carpet, and I said, I, I'm guessing it's probably pretty far from the bathroom, but I, I, I don't know. I, I have sat by the, uh, the kitchen before there, so, you know, you can tell when you're, when you're doing well, uh, you, 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 you get closer and closer to the stage. So, yeah, it was, um, can, can, can't have uh, asked for a better night. One of my favorite moments along those lines was maybe 20 something years ago and Burt Reynolds won for Evening Shade. Uh -huh. and, you know, most of the TV people, like you say, are sitting in the back. Yeah. Um, he makes his way all the way up to the stage. He says something along the lines of, I used to be down here with the film people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to have a peace treaty between the two uh, camps because it is, uh, it is, there's like, the, the TV get, you know, they, then sometimes they get those awards over with quick and then it's like on to the movies and the real meat, uh, the meaty stuff. So yeah, we, I was, I was definitely flinging little pieces of butter at all the TV people because I used to be up there, but now, haha, -ha, uh, it was, it was, it was really, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I it was a surreal night. Um, so, uh, and, and, and it's just great to hang out with, uh, people you admire, you know, I've admired those people my whole life. And uh, I don't know, there was something eerily normal about it, I guess, because everybody's just there to, to drink and hang out. And I don't know. And then Meryl speaks and everybody completely, you know, shuts up. Uh, and it was incredible. Uh, I felt like I was witnessing history. What did you think of, I mean, you're watching it live there, you're a few feet away. What did you think about her speech? I, you know, like everybody else was, uh, I, I was incredibly moved um, and inspired. And, uh, but the, you know, the, the, the classiness with which she does everything is, it's just unparalleled. And it is actually to get up and to talk about you know, a bully without bullying or without being snarky or, you know, all of the millions of easy kind of pot shots you could take at somebody like him. She, she, she's just above it. And, uh, never uh, even said his name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I was, I, I definitely, it, I felt the energy in the room change and she's just uh like in everything she does there's it's like she's channeling something sort of divine i i, I guess i um yeah so i i i was proud and it's such a because it's such a it, i i was so i was next to her and i and she got i could see she was well she was about to get up and speak and i you know i knew she was going to say something profound as always but probably political and it's scary you know it's a even when, again, there's such an easy target, and we know everybody certainly in that room is probably on her side, uh, it's still scary, you know, to get up and say something uh, like that. So I, I, yeah, I was very, I commend her and I'm constantly in awe.
Did you say something to her when she got back to the table? Yeah, I so said I went to the bathroom. I missed it. What, did you get up? How how did it go? Uh, <laughs> no, I I was. Um, it's hard to say something after, you know, after that kind of uh, that that rousing sort of brilliant speech. It's I mean I I did I said it was, that was phenomenal. I think you know, but it's like the when I was working with her too. There's just it's a almost an odd. It's almost odd to praise her or compliment her because you feel it's like what Viola was saying when she was introducing her. She said how her husband kept saying, "When are you going to tell Meryl how much you love her? How great she is?" Like, I, I remember I had I had that experience, you know, too, because I worked so closely with her for for a long time, and there was a point in the beginning where I was like, I just want to tell her how brilliant I think she is. Just, just in this, I don't. I'm not going to like write her, you know copy her IMDb page and say, and then in this film and that, but just in what our work together. And so I finally did. And, and it is, there's something, it's almost like, cause you assume she hears it all the time, which she does, but at the same time, people are afraid to probably, you know, I don't know to, it's, it's almost, there's, a, there's something intimidating about approaching her and saying, you're, you know, <laughs> you're a revelation or whatever. But uh, anyhow, yeah. So you, you know, it's, She's it, the, she she has created such a legacy that it's um, it must be hard to just fill her own shoes. I would imagine too, from her perspective and her management's perspective. I mean, what? How do you choose the next project? <clears throat> if it has me in it, I think it's a. <laughs> um, yeah, well, she's very. Uh, yeah, that's why. I mean, and look at the taste level. Uh, not just how wonderful she always is, but just what she does and the kinds of things she does. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Well, how did you get this role in Florence Foster Jenkins? Um, well, I, I had, it really came about from Kathleen Chopin, uh, the appropriately named casting director of the film, uh, who I had done a very small movie that I, I wrote and directed called We'll Never Have Paris, and Kathleen was our casting director. And I was just in her head, honestly, I think from, and I didn't really even know her. I only spent a couple of days for, for the little film uh, with her because there, there just wasn't a tremendous amount of casting. But a year later, she emailed me and said, uh, hey, are you interested? And then there's this, this movie. And I didn't even know who it was. And I saw the names Meryl Streep and Stephen Frears and, and I, I, I thought it was like spam, like, I, like a Nigerian prince had written me and said, because I it was like, are you interested in looking at this movie with Meryl Streep? I just, there's no way that this is real. And I read it like five times. I realized, oh my God, it's Kathleen Chopin. And I read it immediately and I was moved to tears and I laughed and I fell in love with the, the world and, and Cosme McMoon, this character. And I wrote her back and I said, I will do anything I can to be a part of this. And did, did you know I play the piano as well? And she said, Oh my gosh, it's Kismet. Steven's coming to town. I sat with Steven. Uh, he asked mainly about how well, good of a piano player I was, how could I play and act at the same time. But, and the truth was, I, I was a good piano player. I am a good piano player, but I played jazz and I played rock and popular music and I don't play classical and I don't play opera. Uh, it was uncool enough to be in the jazz band in high school. I didn't have to, to really just kill all hope of popularity and join the opera scene. So I... Um, I just never learned classical and I didn't read very well at music and so, but I lied to Stephen because that's what you do when you meet, you know, British royalty. Um, and he believed me and he hired me. I mean, it was like immediate and uh, I, I don't, there was no audition, there was nothing, just, he just, that was it. Uh, he, he knew I was the guy and, uh, and then I met Meryl in New York in between to sort of see if the music was going to work and if she could, if she how she was going to do it, how I was going to do it. And, uh, and then the next thing I knew, you know, I, was, I had about four months to, to prepare and I learned, I rented an apartment and, uh, to isolate myself and just drilled these, I don't know what it was, 10, 11 pieces of classical music and opera and did a, a ton of research and tried to, not just learn the pieces backwards and forwards, but then to learn, I had to learn technique and I had, I just studied the, you know, um, these guys that, that were 
actually trained and how they held themselves and then learned about Cosme and the world and then brought them together. How it was just like, a, it was a, a very, very, very overwhelming process getting ready because then when I got to London, we shot all of it live. So we actually did all the music in the film that you see live on camera, you know, not a lot of room for error. She was mic'd, the piano was rigged to MIDI and we did it all, separated the tracks, but did it at all 100% live. So it was a complete, it was like training at a high altitude. I had to learn these pieces and then I also had to learn them knowing that I'd be playing them with Meryl Streep while Stephen Frears was filming, you know, in a tux as a character, you know. Cause at one point I got through the pieces but I was like sweating and hunched over and I was like, wait, this is not how classical pianists play and then Who's Cosme? How would he play the piano? And uh, and then, oh my God, Meryl is going to be here, and the camera is going to be here, and there's going to be 300, you know, background actors in 1944 wardrobe. It was so it was a tremendous amount of, um, you know, panic that I had to kind of make friends with. Um, luckily, my character sweat a lot uh, and was was kind of out of his element. So I, I had these these sort of things working in my favor, like being gobsmacked at by Meryl and what, where I was. And, and so this character has this, uh, you know, uh, fish out of water sort of quality to him. And how did you come up with that voice and that particular, those particular mannerisms? <clears throat> um, you know, it was, I mean, s some of it was just, I don't know, some, some sort of abstract, uh, whatever the spark of <laughs> inspiration is, I think, um, that when I read it, I saw it in a way that uh, was very clear, but at the same time, you know, a lot of the, the elements to, to uh, this character were, were, very, were implied, his sexuality, things were very subtle. And, um, and so I, I thought, okay, well, you know, he's a guy who is a classical, pianist who's never worked in this world. He was lived in Texas. He was born in Mexico. Uh, he's gonna, he's gonna be an alien, you know, in this uh, cosmopolitan socialite, you know, atmosphere. And if his sexuality is somewhat ambiguous, or, you know, we know he looks at, has, a, has a, an affinity for bodybuilding, and he looks at these magazines with you know, these muscular men, is is he looking at it for the bodybuilding technique or does he just like to look at muscle men? And maybe he doesn't even know, maybe we're meeting him at a moment of naivete and discovery and, uh, you know, and that's, so th those things informed to me the innocence and the lack of cynicism and just the pure joy that this guy might have. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I just imagine him like a gecko, I guess, I don't know, that neck out, eyes on the side of his head. Um, and uh, there was something, again, very alien to me about him, but pure, just absolute purity. And he had to deal with this sort of, uh, uh, he almost became an accomplice to a, you know, in this odd conspiracy of kindness to, you know, in terms of insulating Florence. And this is a guy who probably has never had a confrontation in his life or kept a secret in his life or had to lie to a, his boss or, you know. So I, I just thought, He's the eyes of the audience, um, and it's constant discovery and process, and that created, to me, the body language. And um, and there, there was one also tip when I was I was taking some lessons, and the the teacher told me that in the conservatory, all these piano players they'd walk around with these very long arms because everyone was always told to feel the weight almost when you're playing the piano that your fingers are almost being weighed down through the keys, and imagine you're. The, the keys hitting the floor and and so I thought oh my god these long arms that's such a clear image to me from high school these not me but other people had growth spurts and they'd come back from from summer break and they'd be like out like gangly like they weren't in their body yet, or a puppy you know that's so that too uh, yeah and I don't know I I, I worked so hard because I was so excited about it and uh um and then I you know we went and shot and Stephen Frears doesn't say a whole lot, so we kind of got to do what we envisioned, and and he's a genius in like a, a very uh, eccentric, quietly kind of conducting the set, but not 
not a lot, not a big talker. A particular favorite moment of yours? I know one of mine. Soon after we meet you, you finish that first rehearsal, and we see you get in the elevator where you just cannot contain the laughter. I just <laughs> love. I just love that moment. Thanks. Yeah, I love that too. I um, that was a <clears throat> that was for me kind of a. I mean, there were a lot of things in this movie that were, you know, challenging or daunting, even just in getting ready for it. Oh my God, you know, from playing just the music element of it, but there's there's like emotional scene and there's a scene with, with Meryl where she comes to my apartment, which I'm a big fan of, I think came out really well and, uh, but was, was intimidating because it's just her and I, and it's sort of an anomaly in the middle of the movie but the laughing scene in some ways was the, the most scary for me because laughing is really, really hard to do as, a, as an act on cue. I mean, crying is actually, is, is I think, you know, these things are, there, there's something easier about emotion or I, I don't know, but laughing is this like m muscular reflexive kind of thing. And if it's fake, it is, it's really bad and it's really obvious. And, um, and I asked Meryl because I was like so scared of this. Uh, and before we shot, I said, oh, I, how do you laugh? I mean, I, I don't know what to do. I can laugh for maybe a second, but I'm supposed to have a fit in the elevator. And she said, oh, well, you know, just try to cry. That always makes me laugh. And I was like, oh God. And then I said, and I was like, no, really? And she's like, well, I don't know. I, Cause I said, oh, in, um, in adaptation, there was this scene where she's laughing on the bed, and she's so amazing. I said, in adaptation, you had this incredible laughing fit, and how did you do that? And she was like, I don't know, I just did it, you know? That's how her answer is always like, I just believed it. And I went, oh, well, thanks a lot. Um, so, we, yeah, that scene was like a, that, I think it turned out really well, and it was a tricky one, because it was, um, and Stephen actually involved me in some of the, in in kind of how I saw it and how to shoot it and how to cut it together and um, actually asked me about that a lot that scene particularly and I I couldn't believe that he was you know sort of in asking like well how do you envision where do you see the camera or like well how do you see would you should how many people should be in the elevator and like how do you think we should cut it should we see you coming from and I was like are you kidding you know uh, but he's very collaborative that way. So yeah, ultimately, you know, I had, I feel like I had a, a, a nice hand in, in some of that stuff. And, and I, yeah, it's a great scene. People like it. I, again, I think that's the moment where the audience can go, okay, we know how to get into this world. Like this is, we're in, this is like a loony bin. Um, so. You do so many great impressions. We've seen it for many years on the various shows, but if you got a good Hugh Grant in you. <laughs> Uh, I think I've done well. Um, you, you know, he, he has, you know, he can get um, really, he, has, he can get blinky and um, really charming, you know, um, extra, extra charming. So, uh, but he probably wouldn't like that. Uh, he's not quite that way in this movie. He's, he's a little, you know, he used to be more, I'm thinking of like Notting Hill era. Uh, Hugh Grant, he's, you know, he's refined himself. I mean, I love, I've always loved, I actually used to do a better impression probably than I just did, but in, in high school, because I, I think I had that hair that was like parted in the middle. And I, I remember, I mean, I grew up watching his movies. So I, I really, uh, I always liked him. He's, he's um, dangerously charming. <laughs> um couple of last questions. You and Jim Parsons both have big awards related movies right now. Uh, he's got Hidden Figures, obviously, and you've got Florence. Uh, is that something you've talked about? Like, can you believe that we're in these two massive <laughs> hit, hit movies? No, I mean, not in that way, not in like a kind of, you know, stroking our egos way, but uh, definitely, you know, oh, hey, uh, so I heard uh, you guys got, nominated for a PGA award. Yeah. Like we didn't, we didn't get nominated for that, but that's cool. You know? Um, and he's like, Oh, did we? And then he'll say, Hey, I saw you got the golden globe. Oh my God. And I'm like, Oh, are you going to be there? No. And, oh, sorry, Jim. Well, so we, we, uh, we sort of talk about it peripherally. It's really cool. I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm kind of joking. We don't really like, you know, 
rib each other about it. I actually, I am a terrible friend because I haven't seen his movie yet because I've been running around so much. But um, but I hear it's it's wonderful, and I think it's such an awesome moment to for both of us to be in completely contrasting things from the show. And I know, you know, because he's such a close friend, I just I know that we aspire to both of us particularly to to do those these kinds of projects and to differentiate ourselves from not just for the sake of doing of differentiating ourselves from these characters but we're both actors and you get uh, something like the big bang which is amazing but then you're on it for if you're lucky enough like us you're on it for so long and you're playing one character that you kind of you it you you itch to play something else and then sometimes people forget that you can play something else and so with this film with Florence people actually said they watched the whole movie and didn't realize that it was me from the Big Bang and and that Big Bang's their favorite show and they and I'm like that which is mind boggling but also the highest compliment. So I I I'm just uh yeah it's a great moment to see Jim and uh in, in that movie and it's getting so much recognition. You will have to ask him, this happens occasionally to people when you all go to the SAG Awards here in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is he going to sit at the Big Bang table, or is he going to sit at the Hidden Figures table? Because he sits at that hidden, hidden Figures table. You you've got to uh, you got to rib him about that a little bit. Yeah, I think he should just his chair should have wheels, and he should just kind of like push himself from table to table. Uh, yeah, I don't um, know if you remember a couple of years ago. I think his name's Alan Leach. He was an Imitation Game, but he's also he was the chauffeur who married into the family on Downton Abbey, and he oh. sits, he sits at the Imitation Game table. And then Downton wins for drama series. And he's, trying to, he's trying to walk up the steps with him, and they're like, oh, now you want to join yeah. the Downton group. That's, yeah, exactly. That I will not tolerate. He needs to stick with us when we lose again at the SAG Awards. I, if he moves after that, um, I, I, will, I will take it personally. Yeah, I, uh, it's, a, it's such a cool thing. And I know uh, it's, it's just so it's odd. Yeah, because Meryl and Hugh are going to be there, and we'll be there, and it, it's, it's a, it'll be an interesting... Uh, an interesting night. It's I like the shows, the award shows that combine everything, and you get to kind of again. We'll be closer to the kitchen for the Big Bang, but uh, that's okay. Oh, you never know. They might sit your table right next to Meryl and Hugh. Oh well, yeah. Well, well maybe I'll sit on on Meryl's lap if uh, if she'll let me. <laughs> Is that uh, a fun night? Do you like being up together, all of you nominated together as an ensemble? Yeah, that's one of the most fun. That and the Golden Globes. Uh, too, where you where you can sit and drink and it feels kind of loose and uh, and yeah and it's just nice you get to like I remember when we first went I think it was to SAG but you know we we I rounded a corner and um, and I heard somebody go like oh my god and I looked and it was it was Kit Harrington it was who plays Jon Snow. And he was like, I'm such a massive fan. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Like, no, but first of all, my, you know, it, it was a, it was this strange moment to meet somebody you, I, who you watch and admire, but also who I thought like, you know, lived in a, a fictional underworld uh, battling, you know, all sorts of uh, monsters and scary, scary people. And he was there watching the big bang, apparently probably while shooting those scenes. So that was, that was nuts. And also a, a real, that's those nights were great when you can meet people that you like and admire and whose work you admire. And if they have seen yours, it feels, it feels odd. You never really get used to that. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. I, I'm sure there'll be some, some funny run-ins that night. Oh, every every year, I'm sure. A couple of the last Big Bang questions. Are you enjoying the baby storyline? <laughs> uh, I am. I, uh, I they did something really brilliant where they, um, you know, they've they've done this device. The device that they used with Mrs. Wallace, where you never saw her, uh, and she was off camera, is is what they're doing now with the baby. And so, I think it's a nice sort of tip of the hat to. Carol Ann Susie, um, who played Mrs. Wallowitz, and also just a really, a good way to keep the show on the same track, you know, because you don't want to disrupt the dynamic too much. And they've gotten some great stories out of leading up to the baby, but, you know, the, the, there's some great tender moments. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it, they just never cease to surprise me, which is really amazing. And there's, the writing, they are so 
passionate about it and it's they work so hard and are so careful and delicate about telling these stories and making sure that the characters grow at a human rate and that we don't lose the sweet spot of this show you know which is challenging over 220 some episodes so yeah i'm i'm really um i'm excited i was nervous because you never know i was like oh god am i gonna always have a baby bjorn or i'm gonna carry this baby around for you know and i have children and i was like selfishly i was like oh i'm gonna go to set and there's gonna be more screaming babies everywhere i go um but uh no, and Pamela Adlon, who's uh, a wonderful actress, does the voice of the baby as kind of also an homage to Caroline Susie with that really uh, shrill Jewish uh, yell. Um, and uh, it's very funny. <laughs> and what's the status on another season or a couple more seasons? What, where do things stand right now? I, you know, we're only contracted through the end of 10, which we're in the middle of. And, you know, I, I, there's rumblings about more and who's coming back. And there's been no, there's, there hasn't been anything significant that's, you know, indicated a yes or a no. It seems like we're all, the show's doing great. Uh, you know, so hopefully we can figure something out where, you know, everybody's happy, I guess. It's well, such a long running show and such a successful one worldwide, you would think they wouldn't, you know, here in January or February say, oh, this is it. They're going to, I think, you've got to think there's at least going to be one more season. Yeah, you would think, I mean, I, I can't imagine that CBS and Warner Brothers are ready to say goodbye. And I, and I think we all, we all have a very good time doing it. And it's a, just an, a crazy moment for television. There's so much w wonderful stuff and, most of it's not on the television <laughs> anymore, you know, or on network broadcast television. There's, uh, not, I mean, not trying to disparage the stuff that is on there, but in terms of the amount of platforms there are to, to make shows. And um, so to have, you know, see eight o'clock broadcast television show getting these kinds of ratings after 10 years, um, it is, uh, I think everybody, I don't think there's anyone who secretly knows why that is happening. I mean, aside from it being a great show, I think it's, it might be the last of that, you know, breed, I guess, you know, because when our show started, there was no Netflix and there, Amazon and, you know, there, there weren't, there just weren't as many shows out there. Breaking Bad hadn't started, you know, like this just wasn't, uh, if you watch TV, you watched, you know, the same handful of channels, I think. So it's different now. Um, and I think everyone's aware of that, that we're, we have something pretty spectacular that we're still holding on to. Well, not only do you have that, but this wonderful Florence Foster Jenkins. I'm so glad of the success for, for the film, but also for you. I just, I love seeing you in this movie. Thanks. And uh, hope it leads to more good award success. But um, um, thank you so much. We always enjoy talking to you. So thank Thanks. you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for having me.